Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Hey folks, it's Shay here, and welcome back to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. I am glad you are here. Today, we are going to be talking about the history of the beef checkoff, as well as answering a few misconceptions that are floating around, or really even just some questions that producers have. So if you follow me on social media, you know that I put some posts up and allowed you guys to submit these questions ask, have conversations about them. And those are the questions that I'm asking. So if you were one of those individuals who submitted a question, thank you for that. And just know that you are going to be a part of making this a great conversation and podcast episode. If you did not see those posts, be sure to go follow me on social media. It's something I've done before where I will pull the audience about different topics or questions about a specific topic. So that's really a great way for you as an audience member to have a say in the content that we talk about on this show. And if you're not a social media person, just send me a message. You can go to my website and there's a contact us form and that goes straight to my email. But with that, let's visit with Jason and Andy. Hey folks, have I told you about my favorite app to manage all of the data for a cow herd? We made the switch to Breeder and it has saved us hours. From basic inventory management, calving records, treatments, reminders, weights, running reports, and exploring different marketing avenues for your calves, Breeder has you covered. One of the best parts is they also then work with multiple supply chains so they can offer another marketing outlet for your cattle. We can then choose to get carcass data, which will help inform our breeding choices for next year. To learn more, head to breeder.co. That's B-R-E-E-D-R dot C-O. And the link is also in the show notes. Well, Jason and Andy, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Um, This is a new topic for the show, but I think it's, uh, well, I don't think, I know it's an important one that we as cattle producers need to either be reminded of or understand. So uh, thank you for joining me. Before we kind of dive into some of the questions that my audience members submitted, I'm curious if each of you would please just share a little bit about your background and where you're located today. So Andy, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, My wife, Megan, and I and our four children live uh, outside of Bardstown, Kentucky, uh, so east of the Mississippi River. Uh, We're cow-calf producers. We raise registered Angus cattle, sell some bulls and some replacement heifers, and then also uh, have a commercial side of the operation as well. Small operation, but really representative of what Kentucky producers, uh, 60 to 75 cow-calf pairs is usually the average size of the of of the herd in Kentucky. And so we're pretty reflective of that. Also work off the farm uh, as an ag lender at a local bank here in Bardstown. And uh, so do that and then farm at nights and on the weekends. So that's uh, that's kind of what we do. And I also serve as the uh, chairman of the Cattlemen's Beef Board currently. So bring the checkoff component into things. Awesome, very involved. Jason, how about yourself? Well, I, I live in South Central North Dakota. My wife, Serena, and our four kids are involved pretty heavily in, in all sectors here in North Dakota. My wife's a school teacher. Our oldest daughter, Paige, just graduated from vet school in Kansas and took her first job this week in Nebraska. Our second oldest, Austin, has graduated from college with a business degree and is now home on the operation with us. Our next kid is uh, going into pre-law and going to attend uh, law school next year. So she's got an eye on agriculture through those eyes. And we got one girl left in high school that we're still chasing around to ball games. But we have a commercial cow-calf operation and we do a little backgrounding on the side since we've been raising our own feed here in some decent years. And, and our whole life is surrounded by the cattle business and We're kind of passionate about it, been involved in it a long time. I was fortunate to uh, get appointed newly this year to the Cattlemen's Beef Board. I did serve on our State Beef Commission quite a few years ago, almost 15, 20 years ago. So I have some experience from the state side and now I'm getting involved 
on the national side and excited to bring any knowledge or passion to the discussion that I can. Well, awesome. I really appreciate both of you being on. So before we dive into these producer questions, can you two talk about the history of the checkoff? Like why was the beef checkoff started? Yeah. So if you want, I'll take a stab at that first, Jason, then you can follow up if you want. Um, so in the early 80s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, what producers realized was that uh, beef demand was at an all-time low. The product that we were offering to produce or to consumers was not a very good product. Uh, consumers, in turn, were not buying our product, and beef prices were pretty low. Uh, the industry fo folks in the industry got together and said, how can we start promoting our product, do a better job of making sure that we, uh, that we sell a product to the consumer that they want? Um, and so they tried to start uh, the, the beef checkoff. And so um, that that process uh, evolved over a three or four year period uh, in which they voted, uh, the industry voted the checkoff down twice. Uh, and then it passed the third vote uh, when they finally got it structured where producers um, wanted it uh, wanted it to look like. And so I think it's really important as we go throughout the conversation today that we know that we realized that producers asked for the checkoff and producers voted for the checkoff. Um, over 70% of producers voted yes in favor of the checkoff in 1985. Um, and so that's when the checkoff began. Uh, and so that was the act and the order. That was the law, that was federal law at that point that was passed in 1985 with the producer referendum. Um, and the order was written uh, by those same producers that said, hey, here's how we want the checkoff to operate. Um, and as we go throughout the conversation today, I think there's questions that are going to come up that allow us to talk about, okay, why do we not collect money from the Packers, for example? Well, producers in 1985 didn't want the Packers controlling the checkoff, so they chose to leave them out. Uh, so we can talk about those as we go throughout the podcast, but basically that that process started in 85 and was voted on by producers in the past, and, and it set the checkup check off up as it exists today. He did a really good job of explaining that. I'm just going to give you a short perspective on having grown up. I was a teenager then, and I remember the discussions. My dad was going to meetings and a lot of local producers, and beef prices were horrible. And there was a lot of angst over the consistency of the product and injection site lesions, all kind of things going on. But they had debated that for a long time. And it was incredible to watch from the outside in. We created a self-help program, you know. It was a producer-driven effort that took several chances, you know, to get it passed. But the excitement around it, that's what I remember when it happened and, and when they, they launched it, how much excitement it was. And it really turned the corner then into the late 80s and early 90s when we got away from the war on red meat and started telling the truth about our product. So it, it was an interesting time to see, you know, from that perspective as a kid. Yeah, that is, that is interesting because I always remember there being a checkoff. So that's, inter that's cool that you have that other aspect or that viewpoint of it, of being able to see when it got started. So would one of you talk about what the, how the checkoff is structured today and just walk through that so that way everyone listening um, is on the same page with how it's structured, why those dollars are collected, how they're collected, and how they get divided. So basically when I talked about the act and the order, the act was the law of the checkoff that was passed in 85, but the order outlines how the checkoff exists and, and the day-to-day -day activities that we go through the checkoff. So basically the way that thing is structured is every time a calf or a cow are sold in the United States, a producer pays a dollar into the checkoff. That is collected at the auction barn or whatever the collection point is within each state where that cattle or that calf or that cow is sold. That dollar's collected at that point and then given to the state beef council in that state, if there is a state beef council in that state. Um, that state beef council will take that dollar in as the, as the second collection point, basically, and then they keep 50 cents of that at the state level. And then the other 50 cents goes to the national 
level to the beef, to the cattleman's beef board. Um, and so it's important to remember you've got a dollar, it's split in half, the state keeps half, the federal uh, gets the other half. In the case that there's not a state beef council, which we have 43 state beef councils, uh, so there are a few states that don't have one. If there's not a state beef council, that full dollar then goes to the Cattlemen's Beef Board at the national level. Uh, as far as administering the checkoff at the national level, there are 99 Cattlemen's Beef Board members um, that help make up how that process goes through or how that dollar is spent. And so when that dollar goes to the national level, there are contractors to the national checkoff uh, that present AR authorization request to our to our producers basically uh, and so there's 99 beef board members at the national level and then also there are federation members from the federation of state beef council so those state beef councils that got to keep that 50 cents they also get to send up representatives to the national level that determine how those dollars are spent and so we've got two groups at the national level that then hear from contractors they vote on those requests and say Hey, we like uh, we like this. We're going to score these. We're going to rank them. Jason just went through that process at summer business meeting um, in July, and uh, each each committee uh, will score those, rank those, ask questions of the contractors, but also give feedback to the contractors. And then at that point, the contractors get an opportunity to go back and maybe make some tweaks to their request. Uh, at that point, that um, those authorization requests then go to the beef promotion and operating committee. That's the whole next step. That Beef Promotion and Operating Committee is made up of 20 members, 10 from the Cattlemen's Beef Board and 10 from the Federation of State Beef Councils. Those are elected positions. Um, members of the Cattlemen's Beef Board and members of the Federation run for those positions. They interview with a nominating committee who are made up of the same producers that are, on, uh, that are sent up of, as representatives from their states. The nominating committee chooses those positions and then uh, makes up the Beef Promotion and Operating Committee, which meets in September, which we just met um, first week of September. Uh, contractors come before us, present their authorization requests once again, and then the Operating Committee will determine how they want to allocate those dollars. So the budget is set by the Beef Board, and then the Operating Committee will allocate dollars accordingly to balance that budget. And unlike the federal government, we do have to, to, to balance the budget. So. Um, this year we had $47 million of request, authorization request, and we had a $38 million budget. So we had about $9 million to shave off the top. And so pretty complex process. We can get a little deeper into it later on if you like. Um, in a nutshell, that's how it works. The key point to remember is that producers make up that operating committee. Producers make up those uh, committees at the summer business meeting who, uh, who decide how these dollars are allocated. What I like about the process is the producers from all walks of life, from every part of the country that are paying into this, haggle over the importance of each project when it's presented and what direction they want to go. Being as we have limited dollars, it's very important to get the most use out of them that you can. So I enjoy that process a lot, you know, getting to know other people, what's their perspective. Some people live near major metropolitan areas. We live out here in the Great Plains, you know, where it's grass and cattle, and we gotta ship our product somewhere. So we have a different perspective than they do, but yet in the end, we're all looking for the same goal of improving the demand for our product. And it's a, it's a great discussion, a great process that's been going on for a long time. That's a great point, Jason. And when you talk about the makeup of the beef board, so states send up um, representatives, candidates for the beef board. Those are chosen by the Secretary of Agriculture um, at USDA. Um, and so they choose that those members. The beef board's got 99 members. It's made up of, uh, let me see, 99, this is 93 or 92 uh, producers and then seven importers. And of those 92 producers, about 85% of those are cow-calf producers, uh, just like myself and Jason as well. Um, and so the seven importers get spots on there because the importers actually pay into the checkoff. Uh, just like Jason and I do when we sell cattle, the importers, as they import box beef, um, 
they pay an equivalent to a to a value per head on box beef and they pay into the checkoff. So that's probably a misconception that a lot of people have, but that's why they also get a seat on the beef board. But there are seven importers on there. So what is that return on investment for the producer from their checkoff dollars? Is there like a figure for every dollar they send in? It's like this much back because of the work that um, the checkoff is doing, or can you talk about it in broader terms? So every five years, the Beef Board commissions an independent study. And so we send out uh, requests um, for people that want to do the study, the economic study or the impact study on what our return on investment is. And Dr. Harry Kaiser has done the last two, maybe three of those. Um, we just recently finished our latest study that says that the return on investment is $13.41 back to producers. Now, does that mean, Shay, that we're going to, send Jason a check back for $13.41 for every dollar that he spends into the checkoff? No, it doesn't. But inadvertently, uh, he's getting benefits from that, just like I get benefits from that for the dollar that he pays in. And so that economic study, you can find it at beefboard.org or drivingdemandforbeef.com. Either one of those sends you to the same Beef Board website. But you can look up that entire study. And if you want to want to read it, it's like 84 pages long. I have read that thing and it's uh, is pretty in depth, but basically it looks at what the impact the checkoff has, not only on the value of that dollar that's provided, but the the total economic impact to the industry, but also to to state uh, to state government. And you when you when you break it down, that thirteen and forty thirteen dollar and forty one cent investment. A lot of times I get questions of I don't see that dollar. You didn't write me a check back for the thirteen dollars and forty one cents. Um, so I like to look at it when I talk to producers about, well, what if we didn't have a checkoff? What would the value of that steer that you sell at the yard be? Um, and so the, the, the ROI study this year really dialed in on that. And, and so when you look at the end of the day, it says that basically for every dollar we spent, we've added value to that, to that, to that calf by, the, by 8%. So basically, if there were not a checkoff, um, Every steer that was sold today would be worth eight percent less. Okay, so you look at a three dollar calf. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty sizable number. I think I'd written down some numbers there on a two dollar and fifty cent calf. That's basically a hundred and fifty dollars ahead of added value because of the work that the checkoff is doing. So what does that look like? What what? How does it add eight percent to that calf value? Well, we've got USMEF, for example, promotes our product overseas. And when you look at the return on investment for USMEF, for example, it was twenty four percent or twenty four uh, twenty four dollars for every dollar spent. But they're promoting our product and those in those cuts that we don't utilize here in the United States. They're promoting those overseas, adding value. And and this year, the the latest uh, the latest numbers that came out. The USMEF is adding about $400 to the value of a carcass based on the work that they do. Um, programs like that, but but also building the framework when we do the re uh, research uh, on the front end for nutrition, for sustainability research. Um, back in the 80s, uh, Jason, when you talked about our product not being very consistent, some of the first work that the checkoff did was going out and utilizing trying to utilize that carcass and bringing out cuts that could add value to the carcass. I was just on Facebook today and they were showing a difference from 2005 meat cutter in 2005 to today and how they broke that carcass down. And they went straight through the skirt steak, cut straight through it, threw it into burger in 2005. The work of the checkoff said, no, let's break that skirt steak out. It has value, especially in our Latin market. Let's break out those flank steaks, those flat irons. Those were all derived from the work of the checkoff and the work that our contractors were doing to be able to utilize that carcass differently. And so when you talk about that or internal investment, all of these components collectively add value to that carcass. And a lot of times that is hard for producers to see how it's adding the value. But knowing that we're utilizing that carcass in the best way possible, getting the most value out of it, inadvertently adds value to that carcass for us. You're exactly right. And the muscle profiling has been huge. It it started probably 20 years ago and it's continued. And instead of just grinding everything into hamburger, we're selling it at a higher dollar amount or restaurants are serving it. And it, it definitely has increased the profitability on our side. If we hadn't had that, I don't know where we'd be at. 
One thing I would say about the return on investment, I don't have the chart here. I don't know, maybe Andy has access to it where Dr. Kaiser, when he unveiled this, compared us to all the other commodity programs. We've got a pretty good ROI. There's a few that are higher, but not many. And it's a pretty powerful program. Any business you talk to in the world is going to reinvest in themselves. And that's exactly what we're doing. We can definitely see between the export market and these muscle profiling products, not to mention the food safety side of it that has benefited us just in the consumer's eyes on the safety of our product. I mean, it's a different time than when the checkoff started for sure as far as how highly our product is regarded in the consumer world because of all the work we've done. Great, great points, Jason. And when you talk about uh, uh, the consumer, especially, I think the checkoff has done a great job of, of forcing producers to look at the consumer, the end target in mind first when we're when we're building uh, our operations out and the genetics that go into that, the genetic decisions that go into that is keeping that consumer in mind and providing the product that's good for that consumer. But also remembering at the same time that the consumers that are buying our product today are four now four generations removed from the farmer ranch. They don't know what we're doing daily, and it's easy to get those misconceptions that they see on social media that bash our product. And so our job from a checkoff standpoint is to be able to educate those consumers about what Jason and I are doing on the farm and ranch, but also what we're doing to make sure that their product is safe, that we're keeping sustainability in mind that we're doing those things on the farm or ranch that's taking care of the environment. That's something that I, I pay in about $150 a year into checkoff. I can't promote my product to consumers. I can't tell that story to consumers nationwide. I can't promote my product to people in Japan and South Korea and those big markets. But for $150 pitched into that checkoff, I can certainly help promote that product. Absolutely. Do you two have anything else you want to add about um, the structure or return on investment of the checkoff? Yeah, you know, before we before we transition there, one of the questions I get is, uh, is uh, why are we paying into the checkoff? Well, one, you see that return on investment. And my question be is, if I have a $13.41 return on investment on the farm, something that I can do that's going to add me that much value back, or hey, I can buy a stock, for example, that's going to pay me a $13 uh, return on my investment. I'm going to double down on it. I'm going to pay more into that, into that area and, and try to try to increase my dollar. So the, so my question back is why are we not putting more dollars in the checkoff if we're getting that kind of return? Mm -hmm. I don't know if this will work for you to see this or not, but I'm going to hold up. Uh, I've saved this sheet of paper for many years and they, I haven't seen an updated version of it. It shows where the checkoff is collected and where the population is. So each different color represents 15% of the population. And this is the reason why I'm such a huge supporter of the checkoff. We live in the blue region. We got 62% of the cattle at the time when this took place, but we only got 15% of the population. We need to get to the coasts with our message. We're busy working out here all the time, doing everything we can to, to you know, take care of our animals. But we're not very good marketers and we're not near the population centers. This is why this national program to me is so important. So it ties us all together and we can send the money and the message to the best places and get the most bang for our buck. Great point, Jason. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like you said, we're busy working. We're not always the greatest marketers, nor do we necessarily all ha always have the time to advocate like other individuals do. So that checkoff can do that work for us. And it's a great return on our investment. Hey, folks, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that I 
love the Red Angus breed. And if you want to boost your cattle profitability, choose Red Angus. It's celebrated as the beef industry's most favored female. Red Angus registrations have surged by 24% over the past decade with docile temperaments and environmental resilience. These cattle are not only easy to handle, but thrive in various conditions. Their premium carcass quality and exceptional maternal traits make them a valuable addition to any herd. Elevate your operation today with Red Angus. After you finish this podcast, listen to the Red Angus Remarks podcast to learn why Red Angus is the most favored female. So moving into producer questions, and like I said earlier, these are some questions that I put a post out on social media for people to, you know, I said, what questions do you have about the checkoff? And these are some of the questions that I received. So we're just kind of going to go through them one by one. Um, if you're listening and you submitted a question and one doesn't get asked, it's probably because we maybe addressed it earlier, or if you still have it afterwards, you can send me a message and we'll get you an answer. But the first question, with all the money we pay to the checkoff, why are we using it for ads in Cattlemen's Magazines? Good question. Um, you know, I got this question on a podcast recently, and I really, really muddied the waters a little bit on how I answered it. So I want to look at that a little bit differently. And so why are we preaching to the choir is usually the number one question. Why are we why are we getting information out to our producers about the checkoff when we need to be hitting consumers? And so I look at it as if I were a shareholder in a stock or a company, for example, or the bank that I work at, for example, we get annual or quarterly reports. We actually get monthly reports on what the bank is doing or what my stock uh, is doing with the company that I've invested in is doing with, with the money that I've invested. And really, when we talk about producer communications, it is no different. It's telling you what we're doing with your dollar, how we're using your dollar to have a $13.41 return on investment so that you're hopefully that producers are knowledgeable or learning about the programs that we're doing because most oftentimes, Jay, we're, we're not seeing the communication that goes out to the consumer. If I'm, if I'm advertising or if I'm marketing beef to a 35 year old mother, more than likely a producer is not spending the same time on that or same uh, they're not spending time on that same platform. And I always use the example when I go to speak to a group and, and I'm, I'm in a room full of, of cattlemen, I'll say, how many of you have spent time on uh, Pandora today or TikTok or Spotify? Most of the producers will say, what the heck's TikTok? What's Spotify? <laughs> well, guess what? Who's spending time on those platforms? That 25 to 45 year old mother that is buying our product and she's making those buying decisions for our family. And so if I'm advertising to her, if I'm marketing our product to her, the producer more than likely is not going to see that. But we've got to go to where she's spending the bulk of her time. And that is the cheapest, most effective way. We, we get a lot of times here at the state in Kentucky, we get a calls into the state beef council and say, well, I want a billboard in my town. Why do we not have a billboard promoting beef? I give the example that we used here. It cost about $10,000 to put up that billboard that that millennial mother is going to see when she stops at the red light. But at the red light, do you think she's looking up at that billboard saying, hmm, I need to feed my family beef for dinner tonight? No, she's on her phone looking at Spotify, TikTok, and Pandora until the red light turns green and then she's gone. So where do I want to be promoting that beef? I want to be on Spotify, TikTok, TikTok and Pandora. And we did a promotion with Kroger, for example, on ClickList. And for the same $10,000, we reached 5 million consumers. 5 million consumers for $10,000, where I can maybe reach five to 10,000 with a billboard. Which one's the best use of our dollar? I would argue that that social media ad would be. And so uh, when we look at that, a producer's not gonna see that checkoff ad. It's our job as contractors to the checkoff to be able to, to show them how we're utilizing those dollars. Jason, I'll turn it over. You probably got some different ideas as well. This is an age old question that's been going on forever. You, you hit the nail on the head, Andy, about preaching to the choir. It's a struggle that we have, whether it's at the state beef council level or at the national level. We talk about it a lot. We know we could use those dollars probably better to go to our consumers and tell the story just like Andy did and leverage those dollars 
and expose ourselves to a lot more people. But in the end, you also have to tell the people that are producing the product, you know, where their money is going. And, you know, the younger generation, yeah, they'll they'll look it up online. They have a little different access to it. But some of our older producers are going to need to see it in print, you know, and, and have a handout someplace. We know we could probably use it better in other places, but in the end, everybody's got to know about it. So it's kind of a balancing act. You know, I think a lot of it gets debated each time at how much should we spend. I, Andy, I thought that billboard question was pretty good because years ago when I was on the State Beef Commission, we had a legislator that wanted us to put a billboard so he could see Sam Elliott's face every day driving <laughs> into work from, you know, 50 miles out of town and feel good about the product. Our point was, we'd love to do that. We have limited dollars. We'd rather advertise to, you know, the consumer in Minneapolis or or Fargo or Bismarck in our state even and access them rather than spend it. But they do want to hear the message. So how best to do that gets debated every year, how much money we should spend. There's no doubt that social media is a bigger bang for your buck now for for every platform that's out there versus putting it in print. But I think a happy medium is, is the best thing we can do at this point. And we also get people that are glad that they see it in there. You know, you get a little bit of that. So it depends on the age bracket and, and uh, your perspective, I think, where you want to see messages. But it's, it's also really important that, that, that producer sentiment around the checkoff is positive. Uh, it's really easy to hear on social media today, the loudest voices are usually the negative voices. Those are the ones that you hear from on social media that cause the biggest stir and, and want to bash the checkoff, for example. But if you look at it, uh, the Beef Board puts out a, a publication called The Drive. And if you're not subscribing to it, I'd encourage you to do that. That that publication is one. Um, it just won two major, major awards uh, for the best agriculture publication, uh, which is which was pretty awesome considering the, the great publications that are out there. Uh, but it basically is just giving you a run through of what we're doing with those checkoff dollars. And I think that's a great way to, uh, to educate our producers about those programs, the fastest way to do it. And for those guys that still do everything in print, Jason, I'm one of those guys. I, I'm on the younger side, but I still like, like the drive in print. I like to read it. Uh, so it does cost us money to send that out. But what we've realized is we poll we poll producers across the country on a regular basis just to see where their thought process is. And and we've seen that the checkoff generally is 70 to 75 percent approval rate across the country when we do those polls. And it's random polling. Um, since that drive came out, uh, we've seen those numbers steadily increase, which says, hey, when we give knowledge back to producers and they understand what we're doing with that dollar, they're more likely to be. Uh, responding responding in a positive way about how those dollars are being spent. And I think it's important that we do that. Absolutely. And we will make sure to link some of those resources and these websites that you're talking about in the show notes for anyone who wants to access them after we listen to or after you finish listening to this episode. I'll make sure those are linked for everyone. Be great. Now the next the next question, why doesn't the packer pay the $1 per head. And Andy, I know you touched on it briefly towards the beginning, but if you two would talk a little bit more about why the Packer isn't paying in today. Yeah, uh, and I, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. <clears throat> I think from from history lesson, one of the first times that they tried to pass the check off, the Packer was included in that to pay into the check off. Producers failed that, uh, that first referendum because they didn't want the Packer to have control of the check off. And basically, the sentiment at that point was if we let the Packers pay into the checkoff, they're going to have the most seats on the board. We don't want them controlling how those dollars are spent. We want it to be grassroots producer level driven. Um, and so the vote finally passed the third time without the Packers being included. Now, does that mean that the Packers are not pulling their weight when it comes to beef promotion or beef research? Not necessarily. Um, they're still promoting your product in a different manner, but they're also still partnering and doing safety and nutrition research uh, behind the scenes. And that's something that a lot of producers don't get to see. Me, 
Um, I was one of those that I didn't see it on the front end. I didn't think the Packers were contributing any money. I see it now in some of the some of the research projects that come out that are Packer funded through different foundations that do some of the research that is handed down. The Packers will pay money into those foundations uh, through research promotion. Um, those uh, foundations will then partner with checkoff programming to do research project and, and kind of pool funds together that way. And so it is important to remember that, hey, the producers didn't want the Packers paying in, and that's why they don't pay in today. Now, if the Packers own the cattle themselves more than 10 days, the order says if, if you own cattle for more than 10 days, then you're required to pay into the checkoff. And so in some instances, the Packers do pay into the checkoff if they own the cattle more than 10 days. I don't know if I have much to add to that, but that's exactly the discussion that took place over the years. And even when there was discussions about, you know, changing or increasing the checkoff, if the Packers are going to pay a large portion of it, then they're going to have a say in all of that. And and I don't think most of the producers wanted to lose control of that. So that's where we are today. And, you know, I, I've sat on committees in the past where there were small, you know, operators and people that had experience in the packing industry to give a different perspective but not i think what people are referring to is the big boys you know and the big the big four and and it's worked quite well up to this point and and i think that's that's been the discussion ever since to keep it this way for now all right the next question is when do we vote to increase the per head assessment? Wow, great question. Um, it's one I ask myself on a regular basis. Um, right now, we do not vote to increase it unless the industry drives it. Um, and so um, the way the original act and order was written in 1985, it doesn't come up for a revote ever uh, unless the industry um, decides to vote for a referendum. Um, and that takes um, a certain percentage of cattle producers to sign a referendum to be able to do that. Um, so if we wanted to increase checkoff revenue, the industry would have to collectively get together and say, hey, we want to do this. And, and the process is really not that complicated. The, the industry would get together, decide they wanted to have a referendum. They would write a new order on how they wanted it to look. Um, they could either open up the 85 Act and re-vote on that if they chose to do that. That gets a little bit complex. Um, or they can use other avenues to create a new parallel checkoff where um, they could create a, a different f a revenue source that way. And so there's a couple ways they can do that. I know states collectively have passed their own state checkoff. Most of those funds don't go to the federal level, to the national level, to promote national programs. They stay at the state level. Um, but that it would be a producer uh, driven argument. Um, I will tell you that that original dollar that was passed in 1985 now has 32 cents of buying power. Um, so we've lost, we've lost what we can do or the power that we can have with that original dollar. Not to mention cattle numbers are severely lower than they were in 1985 for multiple reasons. Uh, one, because the carcass size has gotten so much larger, we don't need that much beef, to be honest. We don't need that many cows. Um, and so every year you hear that carcass size going up to, I think now the average is 910 pounds. If you look back at 1985, that carcass size was below 700 pounds. So that takes a considerable amount more beef or provides a considerable amount more beef on the market uh, today than it did in 1985. Um, I would encourage producers to think seriously about it. I can't drive it from a beef board perspective. We can't have a say so in that, but we can say, hey, we need those dollars. That buying power is getting limited. I get a, I get a question a lot of times, Shay, why are we not promoting beef on the Super Bowl? Well, a Super Bowl ad would cost us about three to $4 million. And to be honest, NCBA, for example, is one of our largest contractors. Their advertising budget is about $8 million. So if we were to just pour it into a one minute or a 30 second commercial on the Super Bowl, they'd be spending half of their advertising budget for the entire year on one 30 second commercial. And so really, is that the most effective use of our dollar? Probably not. So what we've realized is we can still promote on the on the Super Bowl, but in different ways that cost much, much less money. So 
That was a long-winded question or answer to your question, but but um, that's where we are today. Jason, I don't know if you have anything to chime in there. I think the number is 10% of the producers would have to sign a, you know, a petition for a referendum, you know, to bring it up. That's bring it up for a vote, but even to forward it on to increase it, you could go the same route, I'm sure. That's nothing that we on the beef board have anything to do with. That's all of the state organizations, all the producers, you know, that would have to go through Congress at a federal level. And it's been talked about a few times in the past, but it is a, it is a mountain of work that goes into that. And Washington, D.C. is a different place than it was probably in the 80s, you know, too, when they passed this. The third time it went through, I, I think one of the most disappointing things for me over the years, it was necessary to get it passed the way I understand it. They simplified it. It was a dollar ahead on every animal because they had had different proposals in the past, but that made it very clean, very simple. The problem is if you compare us to like a soybean or a corn checkoff or some other commodity that was based on production, just like what Andy talked about, if it was just pounds of beef or, you know, price of our, our animals over time, if it had a way to fluctuate as a percentage, we would have the buying power we did back then. But they simplified it back then, made it easy to pass, but didn't have a mechanism for any increases built into it. So right or wrong, that's what got us here today. And it makes it even more important from a perspective of those of us that have been appointed to these positions to scrutinize every dollar that is spent because 32 cents on the dollar buying power compared to the 80s, you got to make it stretch. Luckily today, social media does provide a lot of that opportunity when they when they passed the check up, there was three or four major you know t v stations back then, so you could put an ad on there, and a large part of the country would see it nowadays with the thousands of channels out there that's such a small part of people's viewership anymore. I know people would love to see ads on t v but I bet Shay, how much t v do you watch I mean other than something you need to go to your generation that is not where they're going to go to for their information anymore. No, and I, I'm i probably the odd one out where I do so much on a screen every day, I don't want to watch another screen at the end of the night, but um, my husband likes to watch more TV, but it's not TV, it's Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, stuff like that, and usually when he's watching it, he's doing his own computer work too, so it's not like he's directly paying attention to it either, same thing, I mean, occasionally we'll throw on a movie, but we pay for the ads free version. So yeah. that's something to keep in mind. That's right. And back to your original question, 50, per, if, if the industry decided to go down that road, they would, they would present an order um, to the USDA. The USDA would then approve the order or the act and the order. If you were trying to pass an, an actual law um, that producers wrote um, and then 50% of producers would have that were voting would have to vote yes in favor of that referendum for it to pass. So, um, that isn't that is an uphill climb. I still encourage the industry to try to get the leadership together of all organizations to figure this out. You talked about the uh, floating scale pork checkoff, for example, floats up and down based on price. And so as as inflation has occurred, their price of, or their receipts for their checkoff has gone up considerably. And and that's where we've kind of been left behind. And so a new one, I would would venture to say, would have some kind of floating scale, but maybe even an, an opportunity for producers to opt out if they chose to at some point. So there's a lot of different variables that go into that. I'd certainly love to see something come forth really soon. All right. The next question, are the funds being used for policy? It to answer the question about do the checkoff funds go to policy? Absolutely not. I mean, that is, they've talked about the firewall for years. For people who've never been involved in it and haven't seen it, it probably doesn't seem, you know, as obvious to them. But it's a completely separate part of, you know, the organization's jobs. Uh, Andy mentioned, like, NCBA is you know, a large contractor of checkoff dollars, but there's division 
of the people that are involved in all this stuff and and you don't see that stuff going on. I was a very skeptical person when I first, and I'm still a skeptical person when I go into anything. Nowadays, of course, finding the truth in anything is is difficult, so it's good to be skeptical. When I first got on our beef commission and even, you know, through this appointment through Cattleman's Beef Board, you always got questions and you want to get in there and see it for yourself. And it is really refreshing once you get involved in it and see it to know how it works and understand that when we come in here, the people that are talking about this stuff, it's all about beef promotion, research, and education. You know, all the people involved, that's their focus. They're not talking about what they're going to do, you know, politically on, on the big issues out there. It's actually a more enjoyable space for myself to be in because what I enjoy about the checkoff side is it's looking forward and it's a positive message on where we want to go with our limited dollars in the future. Let the people over on the policy side haggle about all of the stuff that, you know, goes on out in the country. Let us talk about how to improve our product and get to the consumer. And that's the refreshing side of the checkoff for me. Absolutely. From the beef board perspective, um, I mean, that's one of the roles of the beef board. We have auditors that are employed by the beef board that uh, that's all they look at is their coding timesheets and those kind of things. So I'm going to give you just a little bit more in-depth look in, into the checkoff. And so as contractors, contractors present those authorization requests and they're approved by the beef promotion and operating committee. Once they're approved, those contractors don't get a check from the beef board and says, here, go out and do those programs. The contractors actually have to go out and do the programming and then ask for reimbursement back from the beef board. Before that money's reimbursed to those contractors, our auditors actually go in, look at the programming they did, look at their authorization requests, make sure they match up. But then they actually go in and look at their time cards and they have to code their time in 15 minute increments. Um, about what they were doing on those 15 minute increments, how it pertained to the AR. And so it's really important to see that um, behind the scenes look at that thing is scrutinized, not only by our, our auditors, but then a third party auditing firm then reviews it again. Um, USDA has to look at those as well and review it. So it's reviewed really by three sets of eyes before, before that money is reimbursed. And so that ensures basically that that those dollars are not used for policy, uh, because if they were, they would show up in one of those auditing functions to make sure uh, that that they're by the act and the order. The law says we cannot use it on policy. That they're not doing that. I think it would be fair to say, wouldn't it, Andy, that the the beef checkoff is the most highly scrutinized, you know, most publicly noticed one, but the audit procedures are top-notch and it's it's refreshing for us to see it you know you don't have to worry about it because it is so highly scrutinized you bet and i think and that was probably one of my biggest fears about being an officer on the beef board is man am i going to do something wrong there's so many people looking are you accidentally going to do something wrong that that is going to be scrutinized but but those checks and balances are in place and, and those procedures are in place for a reason and they're they're very strong you both have touched on it a little bit. How is NCBA involved? With the okay, checkoff? well, uh, NCBA is our largest contractor to the checkoff. Um, and so they apply for funds just like everyone else does. Um, the interesting thing about NCBA and why they get a black eye, I think a lot of times is as being the largest contractor is basically when a contractor comes in, they usually apply for funds in one budget category out of the six budget categories that we currently have in the, in the, in the checkoff. So each contractor has a budget category. They apply for an AR within that category, and most of them don't overlap into different categories for budget purposes. NCBA is different in the aspect that they apply for funds basically in every single budget category because as an organization, they have so many employees basically they can execute programming in each one of those budget categories. And so 
because of that and because of the success that they've had in in fulfilling what their authorization requests, they've grown to a size where they are our largest contractor. But when you sit in those committees, like Jason sets in and I set in, you see the work that NCBA does um, in each one of those budget categories and the quality work that they put out. The other thing to remember is we talked about that cost recovery, where basically the contractor has to spend the money up front and then ask for reimbursement. That really limits the amount of contractors we can have because a lot of the contractors don't have 10, 20, 30 million dollars to go out and execute budgets and then ask for reimbursements. And that's where NCBA over time has been able to do that and build up that program where they can they can ask for more money because they've got the money to do it and they've got the staff to do it. We just recently sat through that operating committee in September and, and beef producers ask a lot of the same questions that I get is, well, why are you doing it this way? Why are you doing it that way? Why are you producing stuff in the house that you could source out to a third party group and not have to have a, an employee to do that. The answer, the answer is pretty simple, um, is a lot of times it's cheaper for them to hire a quality employee within NCBA, for example, that can do their own video work, their own, uh, I, I guess, media programming instead of paying 20 to 30% more to have an outside firm do that. And, and so as those dollars have diminished, a lot of those programs have been brought in house that's made NCBA a larger contractor, but at the same time, it's allowing us as a checkoff to be more efficient with those dollars. They get a black eye a lot of times because they are the largest and because they do have a policy arm, but that policy arms in Washington, DC, and it's kept separate by that firewall that Jason talked about earlier. That AR process is really an interesting process. If you know, when I first got involved, never having been around it, they got to pitch you their program, you know, and you can scrutinize it all you want. And then you go through the entire process, do the project or research, whatever you're doing. And now you're going to get paid and get scrutinized again, you know, how well you did it. So it's a pretty intricate process. And, and, uh, I, my skepticism that I talked about earlier, it was really alleviated a lot when I saw how that process works. You know, we, we really highly scrutinize that, whether you're on a state beef council or on the Cattlemen's Beef Board, all of that comes back and, and is looked heavily on. And if, if there's something they don't agree with, they don't pay for it. So that's a, that's a pretty tight process. Okay, well... Moving on to our next question, is there an option to opt out of paying the checkoff dollar? No, not currently. In 19, 1985, when it was written, the act and the order was written, there was no option to opt out. I, I kind of referred to that earlier. If they were to try to pass a new checkoff, that could be something that they could write into that order. But currently in the 1985 act and order, there's no option to opt out. So. Um, that was done so that everybody paid their way, that there weren't any, as you would say, free rides where somebody didn't have to pay into the checkoff, but they got the benefits of, of what the checkoff was doing. And so that was the producer sentiment in 1985. And I think a lot of that still sits today. Yeah, that's, that's the absolute answer on the national checkoff that was put there for a reason after the third vote, that's where they came to the conclusion, there are some states that have passed additional fees, you know, and some of them have varying degrees of of uh, the ability to opt out or get a refund, you know, on their money. But the, the national checkoff is everybody benefits, everybody pays. So which investment area offers the best ROI for checkoff funds? Well, we recently did the, the ROI study, but the interesting thing about the ROI study is that it looks at the checkoff as a whole, not as independent uh, budget categories. And so um, each one of those provide their own level of success. Um, and it's really hard to break it down and to break out the impact or the, the return on investment for individual budget categories. I'll give you an example research would be really hard to say, okay, by doing this research, it provides a $10 return on investment because it's really, really hard to measure that. But without the research, 
the marketing side of things, wouldn't be able to, to grow consumer trust in our product, wouldn't be able to, to use that in a marketing strategy. Um, and so it's really hard to break those out separately. And so what, what the beef board has decided that is that let's look at this thing globally as a, as a whole checkoff, not break it out individually because each one of the components of the checkoff and each program that we're doing, uh, is very, very valuable to the overall success of the, of the, of the checkoff. I will tell you that when it comes to committees, um, each committee will really, really score those things individually. Jason's been in that process. He's got to see it. And so you'll have those contractors come forward. And, and I think it doesn't transfer to the return on investment, but I think that the scrutiny that goes on in the committee, like Jason sets in, uh, really make sure that we're getting the best return on investment by each checkoff dollar that we spend because of the way it's voted on that committee. Jason, you can maybe talk about that a little bit more about your about your participation in that portion. I think the, the committee side of it, we all kind of set, you know, have our preferred passions, you know, or angles on the checkoff, whether it's research, promotion, or the education side. And we're kind of, uh, we defend our committee a little more than the other one, right? You get pretty invested in it. You can see the value in it. You know that you're doing good there. The hard part comes when we feed all of this stuff up to the operating committee and then they got to shave off eight or $9 million, you know, of all these proposals there and pick the best ones. But it's a continual balancing act, just like we talked about before. We'd all love to see more advertising, promote our product continually. But if we don't have the research on food safety or or this muscle profiling we've done over the years or back when we had injection site lesion problems and we started BQA, all of that plays into the message that you're going to promote. So you still have to do the groundwork to build off of all of that stuff. And I'm a big fan of research. And uh, if we had more dollars... There's a lot more we could do with it, obviously, but I am confident in the process after seeing it up close that we're boiling it down to the best use of the limited dollars we have. And so guys like Andy and myself and all the people involved on the beef board can really haggle over each year the best use of those funds. But it's a continual process for sure. Well, you know, when you look at farmers and ranchers and what we do on the farm or ranch every day to keep those margins, uh, operate on margins that are razor thin, you know that we're really good at making sure we're getting the best use of our dollar on the farmer ranch. And really that transfers the same thing to the checkoff. Those farmers and ranchers are doing the same thing with those checkoff dollars. They're making sure that, hey, I may have five requests here but this one's gonna give me the best bang for my buck and this one's gonna be next and this one's gonna be next and this one over here, maybe we wait until a, another time because we just don't have those dollars to spend. And I think that resonates and that's why we have that $13 and 41 cent return on investments because we really nail that down and really focus on what's gonna be the best for us. Absolutely. Well, as we wrap up the conversation today, I know there were a few other questions that we didn't directly answer, but Andy and Jason did touch on them in other conversations. So if you have other questions about the checkoff, we will put more information in the show notes. But my final question for both of you is, what final take home message do you want to share with these people, with the beet cow calf producers? I'm gonna go back to the nutrition and, and health message. My sister is a registered dietitian and I truly believe we've turned the corner on the war on red meat. And I think the checkoff is a huge part of that. When I talk to my sister, when I talk to other people involved in the health industry, and they're talking more about the protein and diet, even, even some of these keto and carnivore diets that are out there solving health problems, I hope we do more research on that going forward. I think it's going to have a lot of impact over time. But just know that people like us, we're, we're really conscious of an appointment like this. We want to do the best with the dollars that everybody pays in and provides for us, and we have to defend how they're spent. So come to the people that are involved in these committees, 
Give them your idea. Give them your take. But in the end, also appreciate the perspective that they have because they're sitting in on these committees. They're having these conference calls, you know, and in, involved in behind the, you know, behind closed doors. They're they're getting involved in all of the ARs and and uh, prioritizing the money. We take it seriously. We want to spend these dollars wisely, and our goal in the end is to promote our product to a wider community of people out there that don't look like us. They don't live like us, and they're eating on limited dollars. They're eating, you know, from different places that don't have portion sizes the same way we do, but they are concerned about the health of their family. They are concerned about, you know, there's environmental concerns, talk about all that. We have such a great message to tell people. We just have to get it out to them. And I don't see a better better way of doing it at this point. Combining maybe check off dollars and social media is about as good an option as we're going to have. Yeah, for me, I would say, um, you know, you don't go out and buy a bull without doing research. Um on what the bull's bringing to the table that can help your operation. You're paying into the checkoff. I'd encourage you to do your research. Know what the checkoff's doing with your dollar. Go to beefboard.org, look up those programs, sign up for the drive, educate yourself about how those checkoff dollars are being spent. But at the end of the day, realize also that for me, like in my case, I can spend 150 bucks and basically pay an expert to deliver a beef message, to do research, to do the things that Jason was talking about, but deliver and advertise and market my product that I can't do with 150 bucks. Or another guy may not be able to do with a thousand bucks, but collectively as a group, by pulling our funds together and putting those together and letting producers choose how those dollars are being spent, but by paying experts to deliver the messaging and do these things, we are creating that $13.41 return on investment. And I think it's really important that something that's lost in, in all the negativity surrounding the checkoff is that at the end of the day, producers are deciding how these dollars are being spent and we're hiring experts to do that, to promote our product. And just think, what if, what if there was nobody out there promoting your product? What would it be worth today? Well, the ROI study says it'd be worth 8% less than it is today. It's like 2.4 billion pounds less beef that com that consumers would be consuming without the checkoff. That's pretty big. That's a pretty big number. That's B with a B. And, and so I think it's important for us to remember that. Do your research. As Jason said, talk to your state beef council folks. Get involved in that. If you have ideas, go to them. If not, uh, go get involved. Get on those boards. You can have the same voice that Jason and I have. I'm a 65 cal guy, you know, I, I don't have a big voice by myself, but I've, I volunteered my time and I've gotten to a pretty high level within this because I enjoy doing what I'm doing and it's all volunteer work, but I feel like I'm having an impact on the industry with my voice and my voice means just as much as Jason or as a large producer because I'm getting involved and I'm volunteering that time. So be a volunteer, go out, learn the messaging, but also don't be afraid to share that message to other producers as you go throughout the countryside. All right. Well, thank you again to both of you for being guests on my show today, taking time to answer my audience's questions and talk about the beef checkoff. Also, thank you for what each of you do as leaders in your communities and on the state and national levels as well. So for everyone out listening, remember, I will put some of those resources for you to learn more in the description and the show notes of this podcast. And the best way for you to support this podcast and other podcasts is to leave a rating and review on your favorite listening app. With that, happy ranching, folks. Have a great day.